An initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership, formed in 2007, Square One DSM exists to connect entrepreneurial needs with qualified resources and to provide guided professional and business direction. Square One DSM helps entrepreneurs maximize their successes by helping them navigate resources, strengthen knowledge, improve skills, form strategic alliances, and secure proper capitalization. To find out more about Square One DSM, visit www.squareonedsm.com. Well, let's get started. Thank you all for coming. I'm Mike Caldwell. I'm with Square One DSM, which is a part of the, Glo of the Greater Des Moines Partnership. And uh, for those of you who are not aware, Square One basically does three things. We do these entrepreneurial networking events, a uh, variety of things, primarily this uh, monthly event, but some other events as well. We focus primarily on helping high growth potential startups from anywhere from I have an idea and I don't know what to do with it next to I need to raise $5 million. How do I do that? And we've been doing that for about seven or eight years. Um, Square One also now has an in-premise full-time accelerator program. That's an application-only program. It's for companies that have got some traction, meaning they've got a customer flow, they've got a repeatable marketing strategy that delivers client flow, but they've, they've gone beyond the incubation stage and they're really at traction to help those companies move to critical mass. And that may be, well, we've raised the $2 million we need to really get a shot at it, or no, we're cash flow positive. So whatever that is. That's basically what I do at Square One. I also run Plains Angels, which is an angel investor forum here in central Iowa. And we have about 90 angel investors now. I would say about 35 are very active. Um, others are, are kind of come and go. Uh, but we, we actually can use more applicants. So if there's those of you looking for funding, please, please consider applying. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started here. Um, next uh, Wednesday, the 24th, is an open house at Square One. Uh, please come. Uh, we are going to be going from four to six. If you look on Facebook for Square One, you'll find the post all over the place. I think we've done a good job of saturating Facebook with Square One posts, but we're going to keep trying. Um, no, seriously, there'll be free food and drink. We'll be going from four to six. We'll have some announcements at around 5.15. Um, we have one resident in Square One Accelerator today, and that's uh, Ben Lefevre with CertainTel. We'll be announcing the second resident um, at the open house, and that person will be there as well. So we'd love to have you come. Uh, and pass the word around on that. Next month on the 15th at this event, we'll have Rebecca Rizbeck. Many of you may know Rebecca from a local retail store called Mint LA Boutique. What a lot of you may not know is she's actually launching a national e-commerce company and has built out warehouse distribution here in town and hired a staff and uh, is doing some pretty amazing things along with running two retail stores full time. I don't think she ever sleeps. But she's got an amazing story. She's very much a self-made person and has, has come from literally nothing to uh, being a phenomenally successful local business person that's now going national. So I think we'll enjoy hearing more about her. So with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about today's speaker. Um, I've known Brian for, I want to say, seven years now, Brian? Yeah. Um, multiple companies, multiple startups. I won't list them all, but I think uh, significance lately is uh, Volunteer Local, which is doing really well. Congratulations on that. Um, Brian and I had a funny thing happen to us when we met. We realized that Brian's father and his youngest brother had been going fishing with my brother and his son for like 20 years. Yeah. We lived 10 miles apart from each other. We didn't realize it in Cedar Falls, Hudson. So mm -hmm. with that, welcome, Brian. Thanks for coming. So how is Bonnaroo? Tell us about Bonnaroo and what, what the hell were you doing in Bonnaroo and right. why is that important? But yeah. let's talk about that a little bit. So Mike mentioned volunteer local. Uh, that's something I started a very long time ago, uh, thanks to a need out of the Greater Des Moines, or out of the uh, Doyne Arts Festival. And uh, it has been a long journey, but it is, uh, it's hitting its stride. We've got some great momentum, we've got some great clients, we've got growth and revenue, uh, things are coming together. Uh, last fall, we scored our, um, I'd call it our most recognizable client to date. No offense to some of the others that are out there, I gotta be careful with that, but it's Bonnaroo Music Festival. And if you're into the music festival scene, it's, it's one of the top four, if not the top one. Um, 80,000 attendees, the volunteer count somewhere between two and 3,000. Uh, it's, in fact, the, um, I think what I read is they clear $25 million a year on gross, uh, the festival itself, and Live Nation just bought it, or bought ownership of it. Did they really? Recently, yeah. So it's, it's a big deal, and it was a nice win. It was a very nice win for us. Uh, and part of the deal of, of winning that, we also uh, negotiated 
tickets for a handful of us to attend. So we were put up, and, and this is camping only, so 80,000 people don't exactly fill the hotels in Manchester, Tennessee. Um, it's, it's, it's chaos of camping, and uh, you should Google it and look at some aerial photos. It's a 700-acre farm, and it's, uh, it's phenomenal. But we were, uh, the six of us that went, uh, were fortunate enough to be put in guest camping, which is heavily wooded, and uh, so we caught a break with, in terms of uh, not only just shade, but also we had our own dedicated showers, and don't get me wrong, they, they weren't the showers like you think of, of a park here in Iowa. It was still fairly rough. Um, I don't know if my wife will return or not. But <laughs> I was going to say, you got her to go. <laughs> she went. She went. She was a trooper. Uh, oh, my gosh. And then, um, so anyway, that, that's a long answer to your question, but we, uh, we were at Bonnaroo for that uh, event, and it was, yeah, it was a, it was a great win. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So a while back, you've been doing startups since you almost got out of college, on and off for the most part, and you said you'd never go to back to work for a company again. Yep. And then you went back to work for a company again. Mm hmm Tell us why and what you did, and sure. why did you do that? Yeah, um, I had a good what ten year run um, with a handful of startups, and uh, it was the the timing. You know, timing is everything. And for people that are serial entrepreneurs, they try things over and over again. Timing is everything because sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Um, I had planted seeds with both Volunteer Local and a startup called Tickly. Um, neither were at the point where I was going to pull any revenue from. Uh, and no, even if I, I already was full-time with them, it just was evident that they were going to be a, a slower growth. You just weren't getting paid for that full-time. Right, right. right. No, I was okay. full-time, yeah, without pay. Like I should clarify that. Yeah. Um, but there was, there was um, capable people in charge of both who were drawing money, and mm -hmm. it, it wasn't going to be a fit for me to do that. So the, the uh, financially smart thing to do, if you're bootstrapping, is to step back and let those that are running it continue to run it until you either raise money or it pops to the point that you come on. So, um, so that was a couple years ago, and um, uh, I went to my my wife, and it was always a goal that uh, she would stay home with the kids. That was, you know, right off the bat when we met, that was always a goal, and she's been very supportive of my entrepreneurial career, which again, which has its ups and downs. And uh, she kind of looked at me, and said, "Do you think maybe this is that time when uh, I do stay home with the kids?" We had uh, the second was on the way. Uh, or he was here or something. But anyway, I said, yeah, I think, I think it's time for that. So I had the seeds planted with the startups. I had a wife that was ready to stay home. Uh, I had a connection, a mentor of mine that I'd known for 20 years who could use the work uh, that I could do for him. And so I actually, you know, clocked in and got a paycheck for the first time in almost a, 12 yeah. years. So. Yeah, but you did more than get a paycheck. You were out selling. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, was putting in an enterprise sales role to go out and sell uh, salesforce.com and consultative services. So it's... Uh, it was still entrepreneurial in some ways because mm -hmm. I was driving my own schedule. It right. wasn't. It was not a uh, corporate clocking in, clocking out. I had a lot of right. flexibility to do what I. But you were. You've never sold before. Not like that. Not like that. Yeah, not like that. So is uh, that a good idea for startups to go through that process? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what did you uh, learn from it? If you're, you know, if you're B two B, and I know we're going to get to the accelerator yeah, stuff. We will. Um, the, if you're B two B, you know, that's that's a fantastic way. I, you know, I see my cousin out there. He's done that. He's been doing that for a long time. That B2B and that enterprise level sales is uh, something I hadn't done before. And it's, um, I don't know if it's completely different than uh, a B2C or small business type sales, but there's just enough nuances uh, that it, it, it is unique. And uh, the experience I got out of that was invaluable, not only um, to speak intelligently about, again, the accelerator stuff that we're going to get to, um, but to just even draw some connections and help open some doors. Right. Well, let's talk about the accelerator. So uh, for those of you who haven't heard the story, um, Tej Dalwan was the interim accelerator director when we started the Global Insurance Accelerator. And his role was to get it up and running, get the infrastructure in place, get the first class sound, and find the permanent managing director for the accelerator. We did a national search, and we searched all across all the Techstars accelerators and across the outside, even outside the United States. And we just we found some people, but none of them we were totally happy with. And the board chair, Jeff Russell of Delta Dental, said to Tej, "If you could, well to me too, but Tej was one that answered." Okay, if you could have anybody you want, who would you want? And he just said, Brian Nemeseth. And I went, yeah, great, that sounds great, but he'll never do it. Brian's got this thing with, that he's done this deal with his wife where he's back to work full time, he's home with the kids, and you had your third, third child on coming way. on the way. And, I said, and they said, well, ask him. And we just happened to have a beer scheduled that week, and I said, okay, I literally said, I know you're going to tell me no, but I've been told to ask you this, I'm going to ask you this anyway. And so I asked him, and you said... I said, are you crazy? And I thought, yeah, I'm crazy. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's a, the, the job description, even just over a beer, it was phenomenal. I mean, it's a chance to work with startups and yeah. 
help mold their path and uh, work with them every day. And uh, I'd known enough about the Techstars and Y Combinator models that it sounded pretty darn exciting. So yeah, it was um, you know, shame on you for not knowing me very well. Well, I just thought Nicole had already solved that whole negotiation. I, well, I'll be honest. So I, I, I thought if, you, if you, Nicole hadn't done the deal, I figured you'd be yeah. interested, but I thought that was a done deal. Yeah, no, so. you know, so Mike did, he shared this with me, and of course, you know, the fireworks are going off in my head because this sounds like a great deal. But I, I, did, I went back to Nicole and I said, this is ultimately your yes or no, because I, I knew from talking to Eric Ingham and some others that the, the running the accelerator um, during while they're in class is a pretty time intensive deal. And so I said, you know, baby number three is on the way, 100 days of who knows what. Um, you need to be on board with this. Um, and uh, she was. Uh, you know, I, I married well. So, yeah, she said do it, and uh, that was it. I don't no know. pressure on her. It's just yeah. my career, my life. Yeah, no. My yeah. life stream, but don't worry about it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, it's okay if you say no. It's just my life stream. I think she read that between the lines. So, yeah, I think yeah. she did. Right, right. I, my best sales job was that one. Right. So you got thrown into the mix. I mean, you really did because you came in. I mean, you started December 15th, but really weren't able to get really rolling until after the holidays, yeah. and the class started 40 days after that. Right. Talked about that 40 days. What did you have to do from January 1 to February, whatever it was, when yeah. they showed up? What did you have to make happen? Well, it was, it was everything from we went and visited with Eric Engelman at the Iowa Startup Accelerator. We, uh, we had a full brain dump from him, and he's been fantastic, him and David. So you know, big props to those two guys. They've, uh, they were very helpful in sharing their knowledge. Uh, I think it's helpful that we are, uh, they're great guys anyway, and they share information, but the fact that we're focused on insurance makes it easy for other accelerators to talk with us about what they've learned, because we're not, generally speaking, competition for them. Right. Um, but we didn't have our class picked yet. We had applicants, but we hadn't really reviewed any. Tej had met with a, a handful of them, but again, he didn't want to go too far down that path, because right. he wasn't going to ultimately be responsible for them. So we had to interview uh, the, you know, all the applicants that we had, um, narrow that down, I was new to having a board. I'd never had a board before. So I had seven board members, our seven investors. And real corporate board people. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I, yeah, I had to run a meeting once, and it was a disaster. I, yeah, I, yeah. So that, <laughs> yeah, it's a little hard. Well, people that are used to, I mean, these are all C-level people from major insurance companies that are used to formal rules of order. Yeah, not guys in T-shirts showing Seconding up and things. And, and right. The really funny part was when he showed up, showed up in a suit. We were all like, who the hell are you? Yeah, but, uh, right. So, you know, communicating with a board, and they're very busy people. Yep. So, um, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, herding cats on the startup side. Uh, but, and I would never say I'm herding cats on the board side, because I'm not, but they're very busy. It's just trying to make sure you get a piece of the, the airtime that, yep. that, that they're, they've got available. So, so that was new to me, uh, making sure your communication is very concise. I right. think that's the best way to put it. Um, uh, the mentors. The mentors is a key part of our program, um, and I don't come from the insurance side of things. I'm looking at titles and people that work at companies and I have no idea if this is good or bad. Um, so there was a, you know, a lot of shots in the dark in terms of mentors. Um, we need to rally and get the communication aligned for them because as a mentor you're a volunteer, you're giving your time so I've got to get you excited about what you're doing so that you show up and have the high energy that you need. Um, and then just the space. I mean, it was drywall was still dusty. I mean, there's there no furniture in the room. It was, <laughs> we were moving so fast. Um, yes, we were. I think we took Ownership of the lease January one, but we really didn't get keys until that first week or so. And yep. anyway, it was it happened very very quickly. Um, and then of course yeah, and then had a baby in there too. So I actually took like 24 hours off to go hang out at the hospital. Yeah. Um, I'm glad it wasn't your first. Yeah, yeah. Although and I think uh, that would have been easier. It oh. really would have been. <laughs> would have been much easier. Anybody with three, I mean, it's the whole zone offense, our zone defense. Zone thing, defense, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, funny story. Uh, has anybody seen? I think it's called Galaxy Quest. It's the, yeah, it's yeah, and they're at the end. It's the the comic book geek kids are on Earth, and and he's trying to guide. You know, he's trying to do this huge thing to save the world or whatever. And and the mom's like, take the garbage out, and the guy has to you know stop from saving the world to go take the garbage out. I feel like that sometimes I'd be at home, and be like, these startups need me, and there'd be all this stuff going on. My wife would be like, feed the baby. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this is important. I know. I'll feed the baby. A little grounding in life right, there, right? right? Yeah. yeah. So. so, for the sake of the audience, talk a little bit about. I mean, I think a lot of people really aren't aware of how, who owns this accelerator and how did it come. Not so much how it come together, but now that it's running, I mean, how is it managed? I mean, you're running it day to day. There's a board, but yep. maybe talk a little bit about how it's funded and and yep. how it's going to go forward. So I want to get to how we're going to go forward. Yeah. Right. So. so how this all came together? Seven insurance companies uh, all stepped up. 
and uh, and uh, they are the the private funders for this thing. So different than Startup City, which was was publicly funded, this is privately funded. So I have initiatives and mandates from those seven uh, to accomplish their goals. And the the top goal number one is innovation. They want to see new and innovative things going on in insurance. Uh, that's really really important to them. Their industry is viewed as boring and and old and kind of stodgy, and, and uh, they want to you know kick that up a, a notch. And so we're we're a big part of that. Um, so that you know that's where our money comes from. Uh, the mentors then is is again it's a volunteer network, and it's for the most part it's here locally, Central Iowa. As the program got more exposure in PR, we had people crawling out of the woodwork from all over the country, uh, which is fantastic. Some really really high level people and uh, the startups that can attest to that. Tyler and Jess, are you the only two here? I think from, right? All right, so. Yep. Yeah, a few of them already headed home, so I won't take too much offense to that. But, um, so the, am I getting to your question? I, I, slowly. Slowly. <laughs> um, so the. We don't know each other very well at all, right, so right, it's right. a little banter. Um, no, I guess what I was trying to go to is, so, uh, the day-to-day, -day, you're running it day-to-day, -day, but there really is a board. It's privately funded. Yep. They've got a set of initiatives. Talk about what else they expect to get out of it because they're putting a lot of money into this. It's $100,000 a year from each company. So it's a big chunk of change. What it, besides the innovation, what else are they getting from it? Sure. So their employees and obviously as the mentor side, um, they get that engagement, that excitement. Again, if, if you buy into the idea that insurance is not that exciting or that sexy, giving the employees a chance to go be exposed to these startups and hear the problems they're trying to solve and what they're working on is very energizing. Uh, the mentors that we had come through were all jazzed about what they got to participate in. So that, that's a piece of this. Um, I, you know, we've, we've got, there's two sides to this, this part of it. There is the community piece, because we are, we're here in Des Moines, there's a lot of great activity around startups going on. Um, the accelerator, though, wasn't really designed to be all that involved with the community. Um, our startups all went through one million cups, so they participated from that stance. But we and we hosted one startup drinks. But beyond that, we we were kind of in our own bubble, trying mm -hmm. to focus on our own thing. And that's that's because these startups are competing at a global level to try to build their business. And um, it's not that Des Moines and the startup community doesn't have as much to offer the game. I just pointed out startup drinks and the, the connections they made in One Million Cups was all fantastic. But there's a bigger picture um, that they're, they're up against. And even in the accelerator world, um, you know, we're, there's a, it just announced yesterday, I think, there's a, a new insurance accelerator out of London. Oh, there is another one. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's now two of us, at least that I'm aware of. Um, we're number one. We were the first. Yeah. Um, and what's, what's unique about the Global Insurance Accelerator is the seven companies that came together. These are all competitors at some level. Yeah. And to have them all sit at the table and say, this is something we're going to combine forces on and work together on, that says a lot. Uh, most accelerators have one or two funders. Uh, and when that, that investor falls to the side or just doesn't care anymore, that accelerator suffers. Right. And so we're unique that we have seven. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to grow to that. And I will talk about what's, what's ahead, but we're hopefully going to grow that number. Um, but we now have competition technically from the accelerator standpoint. I don't know what that means yet. I've, I've actually been introduced to them, so we're going to see where that conversation goes and see how we can actually work together. Oh, it's good to have more in there. Yeah. So what did the startups get out of it? The six companies that came through, we're gonna, I mean, we got one of them in the back of the room, one group, but yeah. tell me what, what did they expect and what did they actually get? Did we, were they happy? Did they like what yeah. they went through? Yeah. Because I mean, you might talk about where they're from, too. Yeah. So we had six uh, final applicants that filled our space for 100 days. So the program is 100 days. They come in, uh, we have a term sheet that we sign with them in exchange for 6% equity. We give them $40,000. So right out of the gate, we're valuing them at a roughly 670 k um, Most everybody coming in was pre-product. So in my opinion, to be a pre-product company and be valued at 670 k is not a bad deal. That's, that's pretty good. Um, now you layer on top of that the connections and the access and the mentors and access to the seven companies that we did. That 670k is really, it's an imaginary number. I mean, you, it might as well be 4 million at that point because the, the, again, the access and the connections is really why they came. So, to, so the, the, mon the money's fine. The money is, it's really just, it's breathing room. It's a chance to stop whatever else they're doing or maybe they're already on their thing full time and it's a chance to pay for travel and they need to live here for 100 days and they need to eat and all that. So the 40 grand goes fast and that, that's not, that's not going to build features. It's not going to be part of a round of an investor. It, it's, it's literally just enough to get by so that they're focused on what they're doing. And that's true for most accelerators. That's, that's nothing new. Um, 
the, the access load of the mentors, actually Morgan, the third partner uh, with these two guys, was on stage at One Million Cups. And I think he said, he either said it was priceless or is worth millions, that mentor and that access. Um, so I'm kind of getting around this, but um, so Justin and Tyler uh, from Ames, Iowa, they, I like to call them our college dropouts. They were, they were grad students um, and they actually dropped out of grad school long enough to uh, be in the accelerator. I think Tyler, you're going to finish out though, right? So you don't want to be that, that, right, right. Parental relationships are very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good. Um, so they're from Ames. Uh, we had one Des Moines team uh, called LifeInsuranceDB.com, three guys that are working on a life insurance solution. Uh, and, and I need to clarify, the startups are all building things that uh, work across insurance. They're not building insurance companies. We're not trying to compete with our investors or anybody else in the insurance world. They're trying to build solutions that, that really are sellable to the insurance companies as a solution. Kind of an all ships rise, or if one of the investors or an insurance company likes what they see in one of the startups, they can pluck them up, they can invest, they can do whatever. But it's, it's the idea that they're building solutions for the, for the market. Yeah, I mean, um, it is self-serving. The whole point is these insurance companies see problems to solve. And a lot of, I mean, I can't tell you any company I know of that has more bandwidth to solve problems than they have problems. They have lots of things they need to solve and they have limited budgets. So the idea is where it's not competitive, why not work together? Why not let somebody go fix the problem and they just all buy the solution versus spending their own money, resources on something that, you know, to be frank, isn't competitive. They don't, it isn't that critical. Yeah. So, so uh, clinic notes from Ames, life insurance DB is from Des Moines. Um, I had Chris from Drive Spotter from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Adam Cassidy and his partner are from uh, San Jose, California, although Adam is born uh, in Ohio, so he had some Midwest roots. But we did get, we technically did attract a Silicon Valley startup, not too bad. Um, we had a, a married couple from Rio de Janeiro, uh, City Mile. And then Pablo was two brothers, Irish born, Australian raised, and they met in Iowa coming from Australia and Berlin respectively. So we, uh, we, had, our, we had a we'll couple figure. international uh, so that we were actually a global we insurance were. accelerator we that worked out all right. Uh, so that's where they were all from. Uh, as far as what they got out of it, the f our program, I'll just jump into some of the details no, of the program. So we did an orientation on day one, welcome to Des Moines, everything from where to eat to how to interact with your mentors. We literally went through every one of the mentors one by one, spent anywhere from five seconds to 30 seconds sharing whatever the, those of us in the room from Des Moines knew about them, just so that it was, they, the pump was primed just a touch. And then um, uh, that was day one. So day two through nine then, we had eight days of mentor speed dating. So we used Volunteer Local, actually, to allow the mentors to schedule themselves. So we opened up 500 meeting slots, half an hour at a time, across the eight days, uh, starting at 8 in the morning until 7 o'clock at night. So you as a mentor would go on and pick your six slots so you could speak with each of the six teams. Um, it was funny. I thought most mentors would spread it out over, you know, like 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and then we'll try to work in their day. But no, these, uh, the, the corporate mentors appreciated the opportunity to leave work and come spend time at our accelerator for three hours. So most of them would do it in three hour chunks between eight and five. So that was a good lesson learned. <laughs> um, we, we were a good excuse for them to get out of work, I think. So the, uh, from, that's from the mentor standpoint, they schedule themselves. From the startup standpoint, 8 a.m. on that, that next day, so orientation was Tuesday, 8 a.m. on Wednesday, they hit the ground running. And it was just this logistical dream of moving six teams and six mentors all over the, the space. I tried to keep it so you didn't sit in one spot too often because you know, got to get the blood flowing, you got to change it up a bit. And uh, we facilitated 480 meetings um, across those eight days. And you know, you talk about what do they get out of it, the value. We probably could have stopped the program right there in day nine and most startups would have gotten 80% of the value right then and there because the doors have been open, the connection has been made, they told their story 80 times over and over again. We had one company, if you're familiar in the startup world with a pivot, that's when you, you change direction. Um, and he got into uh, day three of talking to mentors and realized this wasn't hitting home. Like the mentors were not grasping. He was getting enough negative feedback that just wasn't, things weren't gonna right. happen. And he went that night and pivoted um, in the course of an evening and came back on day four, told a cleaner, crisper, better story and got a much more positive reception. And uh, he's been off and running since. So the, the, the feedback you get, even in you know, a half an hour setting, can be enough to change the course of your company. Yeah, and I think the important thing that you guys, that a lot of them got out of was connections long term. It isn't a one time, it's they're building these connections uh, with basically their customer base. And that was a lot of the goal. This wasn't, 
uh, to raise money. Most accelerators are about raising money. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with raising money, but usually the best way to raise money is to have a whole stack of customers that are waiting for your product. And the investor goes, really? You just need money to finish the product and all these customers come in? That's a positive thing. So that was really a lot of it was building customer connections. Absolutely. So, so we, out of those eight days of mentor speed dating, we would classify you'd be one of three things. And the mentor did this and the startup did this. Uh, you're either there's no match. And that could be anything from I'm working on life insurance. This person knows nothing about life insurance and has no connections for me. Or maybe even just a personality conflict. It's um, I just don't communicate very well with this person. So there would be the no match. There would be what we would call a growth mentor. And it's the idea that I, I like you, you like me, I think you can help me and vice versa. I don't have anything pressing, so we're not going to schedule anything, but I'm going to call you a growth mentor. I'm going to call you as needed uh, and vice versa. Ping me and check up on you know, me being the startup. See how I'm doing. Kick my butt once in a while. So that was a growth mentor. And then the lead mentors uh, were the, the chief cheerleader, chief butt kicker, the person that spent time every week checking in. Uh, we had some awesome lead mentors. And this is, this is what was really cool about the whole deal. I'm fairly well connected. I've lived here 15 or so years now. And, uh, and certainly I recognized a lot of the mentors, even if I hadn't recruited them. But we had this other pool of mentors that I'd never met before. And I was a little nervous about, you know, who are these people? You know, it's, it's a pretty small town. How have I not come across these people? We also had some people come out. Um, if, you ever, if you're ever in the paper, people crawl the woodwork like crazy, you know, and you're just like, ah, what do you want? Um, and so some of it's good, some of it's bad. But we had some of those come in as well. And, you know, and I, I embraced it, uh, embraced the chaos. And... Those, some of those mentors were the best. They were, they were phenomenal. We had some mentors that really showed up. Uh, um, Clinic Note had, uh, I'll just drop it on, Kyle uh, Hamer showed up every week for you guys, sometimes multiple hours at a time. And so to have a mentor putting in those kind of hours, is, it's, you know, that's fantastic. So we had uh, you know, wide range. And I mentioned those three levels of mentors. Uh, out of the 80, I think we had three, um, not three people, but each startup probably had about three where this wasn't a match. So I mean, yeah. overall, it was overwhelmingly positive that out of the 80 mentors, every one of the startups had just a ton of matches and people interested in what they're working on. So that was a really nice, we didn't know what we didn't know going in. No, we didn't. There was a fear of what happens when nobody meshes and each startup has a mentor. Yeah. You know, what do we do then? And it, it wasn't the case at all. It was almost overload. And, and unfortunately, some of the mentors probably didn't engage as much as they would have liked to. So we're, we're done with the 100 days. They graduated at the Global Insurance Symposium. Um, we'll save the story about that for another day. But uh, So now what? Now what's, what's next for you? I mean, you're going out to New York. Yep. What's so going I, on in New York, yeah, and what are you going to do next? I'll apologize. I, I, as soon as it's over, I'm going to go. I'm on a plane at 5.30, and I just came from vacation, so I haven't seen my kids at all, so I'm going to spend the last couple hours. But the 24th, um, come to his reception. I'll be hanging out there and happy to talk to anybody that wants to learn more. Um, as far as what's next, um, yeah, I, I do, I jump on a plane to New York. Um, there's a thing called Accord. I'm not from insurance, so the insurance people are like, of course, there's Accord. Um, I, I, I'm learning what all this stuff is. Uh, but they held an innovation challenge. They had 100 startups apply to it. And uh, I'm a, at first I was just going to be an observer. They asked me to be a judge, though. So I'm on the recruitment trail for next year's class. And uh, tomorrow... You know, by the end of the day, I'll have heard a ton of pitches. And, what better uh, place to find than a hundred pitches yeah, for right. yeah, startups? So it, was, it landed in my lap. I can't complain. Um, and so, really, the, the the big three things, and one thing ties it all together, is recruitment of next year's class. So I'm on the lookout for startups. Uh, I'm on the lookout for more mentors. Uh, there's going to be some adjustments to next year's program. Uh, we may do some semblance of two classes or something that's year round. Uh, but with that, we need more mentors. I need to double my mentor pool. So I, we're at 80 today. We need to be at 160 to 200. Right. Uh, and I need, you know, I need general, I didn't get into the mentors a lot. I'll come back to that. But mentors, uh, we do want to find more investors. Right. We can do more with more money. There's no secret to that. Um, w the companies that came in this year were largely pre-product. Uh, again, I walked through the valuation numbers. You know, if we're going to get someone that is post-product, that has a little, a little bit of revenue and really wants to come in and, and just open it up wide. Grow. Grow fast because they can connect with everybody here. Uh, we need some people that are post-product. It's pretty tough to find that post-product early revenue company that's valued at six, seven, and seventy k. They probably raised around. They're probably worth two, three, four million already on paper. And so to get to that point, um, we may jump the forty grand to eighty. And mm -hmm. you know, I won't 
put this out there. I know we're being recorded, but maybe our equity drops. I don't know. Don't hold me to that. Cause no, we're going to change it. Yeah. I mean, the whole point is we're learning. Yeah. This was year one. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, then, you know, we got to pull those strings and figure out what we do to change it up. Um, I will say the pre-product companies, though, are the most exciting for the mentors, right? Because yep. they're, they're Play-Doh at that point. They're just kind of this ball, and you get to kind of help them morph and change. And you get someone that's a little further along. They're a little bit more rigid, and the entrepreneur maybe doesn't want to change as much. Right. The advice is a little harder for them to take. Right. Um, so we'll see how that shakes out. Let's open it up for questions for Brian on the Global Insurance Accelerator or other things, for that matter. Yeah. Lessons learned from this, this first class in terms of uh, any mistakes you made, uh, what, what uh, uh, refocus on the kind of company you were made to do. Yeah, lessons learned. Yeah, I got a whole folder. Um, it's got about 60 emails in it. Literally, I just would email myself from time to time. And it's everything from just small things to big things. Um, Mike mentioned the Global Insurance Symposium. That was our demo day. And if you were there, it, the pitches went off fantastic. In fact, Clinic Note was the only hiccup. It wasn't even their fault. Someone pulled it. Well, I shouldn't say someone pulled, but the fire alarm went off. And so Justin, mid-pitch, I'd never seen this before, mid-pitch, two minutes in, uh, has the fire alarm pulled and about a third of the room exited. We had about 400 people in the room. About a Big third room. of the room got out and finally this false alarm, they were way back in and he picked up without missing a beat. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a great, great job. You know, he did a phenomenal it job. It was amazing. So, and then of course he gets interrupted a minute later with the all clear note. Um, so the symposium went off really, really well. I don't want to say I didn't think it would go off well, but I started the pitch practice way too late, in my opinion. Uh, we started it with about three or four weeks left in the class. And um, everybody, I don't know if they pulled all-nighters or what, but everybody pulled it together. Um, even three or four days before the uh, symposium, they were still pretty rough. In fact, some of the startups were still changing their pitches. Which yes, made they me were. Plenty <laughs> nervous, because I didn't know what they were going to go on stage and say in front of everyone. So that, that would be one thing. Um, the mentors, we, we threw everybody in on day two. And um, I mentioned there was one team that pivoted their pitch. There was another team that actually got all the way through and we didn't figure it out till the end. They weren't telling a very good story. They had a great story. They hadn't refined it enough. And it was, um, it was really tough for the mentors to figure out, okay, what do you need help with? And so that's something we'll do different next year. We'll probably do days two, three, and four, still doing mentor pitches, but it'll be people like Mike. It'll be mentors that understand uh, I I'm I'm here to coach them with their pitch, not necessarily tell them yes or no if I can help them. Does that make sense? Um, and then finally, just break down the different levels of mentors. We've got our insurance mentors, and within that, you've got your C-level, senior-level directors, and you've got you know, the worker, you know, everybody else below that level. I think a separation of those two because they can help in different ways. And then also our vendor mentors. So we had mentors at HR, legal, design, coding, um, to break those into their own week so that um, the startups understand, like, these are people that can help me tactfully grow my business, and I may engage them later. Um, I, don't, I don't think we'll have any mentor, you know, fist fights breaking out in the hallway because they don't like each other, but we'll, we'll mash them all up together and, and hash that out. So that'd be, there's the two big ones. Yeah. Uh, are you looking to, you have, you have seven local insurance players at the moment, mm -hmm. or are you looking to try to get some, since it says globalinsuranceaccelerator.com, are you looking to get a few, a few out of country or have mm -hmm. maybe a satellite office here? You want me to take that one? Yeah. Or so yes, I mean, keep in mind though, some of our locals are international companies, so principals. No, I'm just talking about them for additional players. Absolutely. No, I just <laughs> want to point out that there are a couple that are Iowa only companies, but the majority of them are national level companies. So um, yes, we would love to have others come in. Uh, in fact, one of the very first companies that reached out to us when we started this long before you came on board was AXA out of Europe, and I think they may be who started the one in London because they. Early on, we were talking, how do we work together? How do we do this? We'd love to do this. But they wanted to do something in Europe. Um, so I, what I found was the ones that were very Europe domicile dominant were wanting to do it in their European market. And the ones who were North America dominant were interested in the North American market from a investing. Now, they wanted to share. So yeah, we've talked to insurance companies from Connecticut through out into Bellevue and uh, all over the country, um, and none of them have gone, we want to invest yet. If they would, we'd love to have them in. So. I, my hope is we'll see that, though. Um, the, the trick is, to me, that there's a lot of value to the investor yeah. being local. Again, getting those employees involved, being able to show up, 
So I, we got to figure out the value proposition to someone that's remote. Yeah, so for example, Nationwide would love to get in except for the fact that I think they just built their own at their corporate headquarters in Columbus, yeah. if I remember right. Yeah, exactly. So I it, was going to, well, maybe it'd be a draw for maybe them to do something more around here, potentially, if they're not already got a presence. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's something so. the partnership works on really hard, as you probably can tell. We're trying to bring more insurance companies into the area because we're very strong here. But you're absolutely right. You're hitting on exactly a lot of reasons we did it. Um, and it, it was one of the interesting ideas of how do you get a Delta Dental of Iowa that's an Iowa-only company to sit at the same table with principal and feel like they're on an equal footing because they may have different needs, but it worked out. Yeah? So as a startup and you have investors, what's the plan to pay out their equity, take money back from those investors? Okay. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, the, the payout for this is not the top initiative. Um, the, we want to pick winners and we want to make good investments, don't get me wrong. Um, I think it, it's a, we want to cast a wider net, right? We want to reach as many startups to learn how they're working, what, what the initiatives are, what the innovation is, more so than, than um, become a VC and try to, yeah. to top out that return. So. So I, there really isn't necessarily an answer to that. Um, there's no expectations for what an IRR would be or that you know, we're going to find the next 200x return. It's, it's really about the quality of the teams we're picking and the, the innovation we're seeing. I will say, just to finish that off, there is a fund, a legal fund, that's been created. It's a yearly, there's a new fund every year. <coughs> the people that are investors that year own a chunk of that fund. Were there to be a phenomenal success that had this amazing return back to the fund, that money goes to the fund and the people that manage that fund, the, the owners of that fund will decide what they want to do with it. Um, but, you know, again, it's, they're never, it was never about, hey, how much money can we make? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's capitalism, we're good with that, but we really want to make something happen in the industry. They'd probably be happier if we solved the giant problem than if we returned a little bit of money. And when you're, let's be honest, if you're one of these big companies, I don't care how big the return is, they're not going to see it on their bottom line. They're, these are people that are doing billions and billions a year. It's not going to show up. And, and that's what separates you from all the other suburbs. Right, yeah. absolutely. And uh, some of them have their own funds already. They're doing that stuff. Yeah. And so we, we, may, we may cultivate that startup to the point where they see it and come in on a B or a C round. Yep. And there's a connection, so they, we've opened the door for that, and that's a reward enough. Right. Our fund may not necessarily see the rewards of that, but our investor did indirectly. Yeah. So you have this graduating class. That's kind of a twofold question. You've got equity, so it sounds like you have a board out there that's separate than you to follow this and track this mm -hmm. for the equity, even though it's not important. Will you follow up with this, these graduating classes and the mentors and say, all right, how did we do a year from now or three years? Where we at? to tweak your process a little bit mm -hmm. and have like call it the, the CBS reunion type <laughs> deal. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I, I view, so um, we have equity in these companies, so I view we're right there along with them, you know, holding their hand as much as needed. Um, so if I get a call from Justin Tyler 18 months from now and they need an introduction that they think I can make, yeah, we're all over that. So we're participating from that standpoint. Um, we, it, again, it's year one, so I don't know, but there is plans to do alumni type stuff. We'll have the guys that, and gals that can make it back to come talk to the classes. I, I'd embrace that. Um, as far as like tracking, measuring, yes, because there is an official fund. Yeah, there we, are you know. fund managers. Yeah, yeah. I will also tell you that most of these accelerators do run a full-up alumni program. We just went, we'll do that later <laughs> when we first get started. But if you talk to like Darian Ball over at Men's Style Lab, he went through Generator in Wisconsin. There's a formal program that's run for the alumni. They have monthly updates. They talk to each other. There's CEO introduction, in, you know, interaction. They can communicate with each other. So he can reach out to every CEO that graduated from Generator and ask a question. All of their investment people, everybody's been associated with Generator from an investment standpoint, he can touch them directly because he's a graduate. It gets him kind of the free pass to talk to everybody. And so I anticipate we'll be talking about those same programs once we've got our alumni moving along. There's some benefits that we're going to bake into next year, too, that those alumni will have access to. So I'll just share it out with you guys. The, um, the idea that the data that the insurance companies have, and they are data companies, um, is really valuable to the startups. They, they're building products or services around it. So if we can create a lab, for example, where the data has been scrubbed and a startup can come in and manipulate and look, um, that's something that's an initiative for us to, to build out. Uh, an alumni, to me, would have access to that. 
So it'd be a, a huge benefit long term. How do you recruit mentors today? How do we recruit mentors? Um, well, I, I got to give credit to Tej for that one. He did yeah. mostly initial recruitment. He did. Yep. And, um, and a lot of that was through the board. So you start with the board and say, who are the employees that you, you know, would be a good mentor, have the capacity to do it. And again, I think it's a reward factor for some of those employees. Um, um, everybody that came through was a great mentor. I mean, we, yeah. they got great reviews. There, so there, when we did a training, we did an hour training with the mentors. There, there really, again, we didn't know, we didn't know. But right. there wasn't a point where we said, oh, man, we really dropped the ball on this. And these were not good mentors. So I feel pretty good about there on that side of it. Um, Part of it's just out of getting more PR. Uh, every time we'd have a hit in the news, we'd have another three people apply to be a mentor from outside of the community. They'd never heard of us before. So the more we build that up, the better off we'll be. And it's a, it's a small community of insurance professionals. It is. And as this got more attention, as people realized that, yep, it's really happening. You know, it wasn't just, I mean, there had been some great press. But until something's actually running and there's interaction, you know, as the articles about these startups would come out, more came out. Uh, but we started with the seven investors and said, you guys get the first shot. You're the ones that put the money in. Who do you have in your teams that you want? Because that's one of their big benefits was their people learn more by being mentors to startups. It helped them expand their own view of the world, and it really did. A lot of them said that was a very big value. Yeah? I'm going to follow up that question with one around the mentors as well. Do you have a sufficient number of mentors who had experience starting up Yeah. Yeah. So about half the mentors were from that insurance side. Um, I recruited a handful of the people that I know from the startup world, some that had done exits, some that were in the thick of things that could relate. Uh, I recruited Ben McDougal specifically because the guy's a s social media dream and he's a rallier, right? He's the um, somebody that gets people fired up. So he's that butt kicker I talked about. Um, so I, I went into my you know, my Rolodex and said who would be, you know, great leaders from that standpoint. And again, we had tactical HR and legal. Um, most of these companies are so new, the whole exit side of it um, is too early to, you know, you don't need that mentor right now. Probably more so you need that mentor that's maybe done a seed round or an A round that can help guide them through the negotiations or what should the term sheet look like or what, you know, what have you seen before. So I, I'm not personally as focused on a, a mentor that's, you know, done a large exit unless they want to come mentor on those other pieces I mentioned. And several of them had. So um, we did uh, a weekly event where we had a CEO of a startup come in. Um, some of them had already, not, not too many had exited. A couple of had exits in their Mad, past. Mad but, but most of them had raised multiple millions, multiple rounds, and, and do that interaction. And then we had quite a few mentors. There were several mentors that had taken companies public from two employees forward uh, to the full IPO. Uh, but that's not what they're mentoring on. They were mentoring on something else, but they had the. Yeah, yeah and exactly. And a lot of these were just trying to give them that guidance. I think I had a question up here, and then I'll bounce back. Did you have one? Um, how heavily involved is the Greater Des Moines Partnership in this? Because Mike keeps using the word we, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, good question. Are they helping to fund the entity or? As a, do you want to take this one? Yeah, we have no funding in the model. So the part, speaking for the partnerships, we didn't put any money in. Uh, we helped them. There was a small investment up front with a facility. Um, we put a small amount of money into some facility, basically some furniture. That was our only dollar investment. We are the fiscal agent of the insurance accelerator. So there isn't a separate operating company. Um, Brian is, uh, that way Brian didn't have to run an operating company while he's also running an accelerator. I mean, it's a one employee deal, so one plus contract, so it wasn't that big a deal. But no, we don't have a, we don't have a seat on the board. Uh, we don't have any ongoing funding. We own nothing of the fund. I say we because they've asked me to stay on the board uh, and Tej both as non-voting members of the board. And we obviously have a huge interest in making sure it continues to be successful as part of the ecosystem. Um, and I think that you know, a lot of the people that are investing in it see us as a partner in it because we were the ones that kind of put the idea together and presented it to them and said, let's go do this. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big we person, yeah. but it's him running it, not me. Well, and I'll get a compliment. Um, he, Tej, and uh, Sheldon O'Ringer are, o are my mentor board. And I, we met every Friday yep. and just talked open. So, because it's, if it's just me, it's easy to get stuck in your own head. And it allowed them to, and us to interact. So they were, they were their own level of mentors and volunteers to me. So when I say we, that's who I'm referring yep. to is that group. Yeah, it takes a small village, right? 
Questions? So back on the small village, so like business owners usually get together and they'll talk about certain issues. So you have mentors, but do you ever bring people in to talk about, well, let's have an attorney come in and talk about patents, mm -hmm. Google, HR, mm -hmm. development, things like that. Do they yeah. come in and say, hey, here's some things you need to think about, not only as a startup, but uh, social media, and yeah. where to go. And sure. So I'll answer this in a broader sense. So programming. So once we got through those mentors, the rest of the time there is programming lead up, leading up to the symposium. Um, there's two parts of the program. One was the 10 steps to investability or being customer ready, um, something Mike and I came up with and then um, he drove it to begin with and we filled in some of the gaps with what the accelerator needed. And it's, you know, who, what's the team? What's the problem you're solving? What's the product you're building? What's your sales distribution strategy? What's your marketing messaging strategy? I mean, it's legal, it's all that stuff. So that was one thing. We're always kind of working on that because those are the things that make you investable or customer ready. And then uh, specific things that we did throughout the program, we did a, a Monday morning stand-up at 9 a.m., which was poorly attended. That was a lesson learned. Um, Techstars in Boulder does a 909. I think it's Tuesday or Wednesday night. It's dinner and beer, and that's our stand-up, and we'll be doing that next year because uh, I think that'll be better attended. I know. Sorry you guys missed out. Um, so that was, that was the only thing on Monday that they really had to do. Tuesdays, we did Tuesday topics, and it's getting to what you're talking about. And we walked through you know, how to find good tech talent, uh, user interface, user design, sales, support model. All you know, We had 10 topics. And the panelists for that were our people from our insurance companies. This is a benefit or a value add to our investors. Um, our investor companies were invited to uh, send us experts on those areas. And I also pulled from the startup community as well. So we had startup and corporate types mixed in together for those panels. Uh, I mentioned one million cups then every Wednesday morning. So each of our six teams had a chance to do a community pitch on Wednesday mornings. And then uh, Thursdays was the CEO discussion that Mike mentioned. We had a, a dozen or maybe a few less startup CEOs, um, everything from a Darian Bod to Matt Ostinick, uh to come and share their story. And it was not recorded. It's a real intimate deal. The startups got a chance to ask very specific questions about what works, what doesn't, what, where'd you fail, you know, so they got into the details. And then um, the only thing that was sporadic was the uh, CEO of each yeah. investor company. We invited them uh, on their time when they could to come speak with us. And I think we had all seven uh, to come and share their story. And, and for a startup, man, to sit in front of you know, the CEO of American Equity and hear his story, it, that just that doesn't happen for your average startup. And it wasn't just telling the story, it was mostly interaction. Yeah. So. The people that got up and talked about their story, I think when Darian was there, he maybe talked for 15 or 20 minutes, then it was almost two hours of discussion. So the idea is to build to just to interact. Mm -hmm. So that, does that answer your question? That was the programming. And those Tuesdays was when we tried to build in those building blocks. Um, that, that was a lesson, that was probably a lesson learned, Steve, to go to your question earlier, um, is uh, everybody's on their own schedule. And so uh, everybody took away different things from those topics and I think a different way to do those would be do them over dinner and um, the, the panels are nice because the people that show up for panels don't have to prepare. It's easy to get people to come to a panel. Um, the minute you need to prepare a presentation or really say hey you're gonna have two hours of Q&A then you know it's a little bit a little bit different. So The other thing I would say is we did these assessments. He was talking about these ten factors and we assessed each one when they first got there mm -hmm. is, is being even more focused on an individual plan for each company. Your company may have a uh, strong in marketing week in dev. My company is all about dev and marketing. We don't necessarily need the same thing. So doing a better, even more about individual assessment and individual, hey, you really, we really need to get you a lot of help here and, and pressing them to take that help, not just saying, I think you should have it. It's like, no, you need to do this because people don't play to their weak, you know, they don't deal with their weaknesses sometimes. You really need to, you need to do that early. If you, you know, and you know me, if you know me, I'm pretty direct, and yeah. you know, these team, I mean, they would get the raw answer from me if, if I thought the team was weak in certain areas. I mean, we, we talked about that, and that was an area we, you know, I was very direct with these teams. Um, one other piece that's relevant is uh, the business model canvas. If you're not familiar with that, Google that, business model canvas. Um, there's nine building blocks of the business model canvas, and there, it's, it's a, if you have a small business, it's a fantastic way to step back and look at the pieces and say, how does my business work? Uh, we don't spend a lot of time on the business model canvas, but the two pieces we do are the value proposition and the customer segment. I'm a big believer that if you know, you've got to know one of those two things, you've got absolutely nowhere to start. 
and we, the accelerator, are giving you access to the customer. Right. So if you at least know your value proposition, you can start to work on your customer segments to prove out if you are, in fact, providing value, and vice versa. If you've found a customer with a problem, you work with them to try to develop the value proposition. So I, I pushed pretty hard on that the first two weeks, and um, most of them got it figured out uh, right away. Uh, there's still discovery as you go, but that's, a, that's another piece of the programming. Um, I'll answer the first part first. So I've never been to the symposium, so I wasn't as, as aware of the attendees. I can tell you the 320 or so people that registered represented about 100 companies. I didn't pull out the titles. Um, the startups had access to that. I just didn't have enough time to dig through and figure out. And I'll be honest, even with the title, sometimes you don't know if that's the decision maker. These are really complex sales. And it's not just about calling one person and getting an answer or even working that one person for six months. It's, it's multiple people. Um, but it, it was. It was geared to be a product pitch in hopes that someone in the audience. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to poll everybody um, yet to see the outcome from that. Um, there were some investors in the room, but again, that wasn't really the focus. Does that answer your first part? All right. And then on the second part, uh, what was it again? Investor pitch. Oh, yeah. So um, we, we had one startup. Um, uh, or if we're sharing this or not. I think uh, it's fair to say that one startup has had a lot of success in that area. Yeah. We're just not at the point where we can publicly talk about it. Yeah. Um, there's one that, that is looking at a, a smaller raise, and we've coached them along the path to, to make some good decisions around that. Um, there's one that will raise money after, and he, he didn't want to touch it till he had specific right. goals he wanted to accomplish while he was here. Very strategic thinker. And uh, once those are accomplished. He's still working on them. Um, he's he already he has his top ten list of who he wants to yeah. go after to raise money from. So he's he's he on his way. Us. He could teach us. Yeah, yeah, probably <laughs> could. So um, we it was more as needed. Um, again, they're pre product, so it's you know we could put together help them put together an investor pitch. But for the most part, that wasn't any of these companies' problems. It, it wasn't necessarily the capital. It was it was um, getting to the point where they could start building that product. Make sure the problem they're solving is is genuine and so they could build the right product. Other questions? In terms of longevity, are you year to year funding from your seven partners? Is there a five year bucket that you know you have to keep the accelerator going? Yeah, it's uh, verbal year to year. So I, I got to show up and do my job, uh, which is great. I, I appreciate that pressure. But yeah, it's um, they're on an annual basis. And uh, like I said, hopefully we add some more to that. And so the 2015 fund is separate from the 2016 fund. So as we, if we attract more investors, we'll just, we'll have a, you know, you may have some overlap. Maybe somebody drops out by year three and we don't get them, but we picked up four more. So and that'll keep this, uh, and that'll keep this exciting just because every year could be different. I mean, the, the 40 grand for 6% may change every single year. I can tell you that all six, all seven investors were extremely pleased. And there was never a discussion of if, um, that was just, what do we, you know, let's talk about next year. I mean, we already have a plan. We have a date when we know that we're going to be discussing our strategic plan, uh, uh, the wrap up from 15, strategic plan 16. That's what we were doing at the last board meeting. So, yeah, but that was so much the idea of not just having one investor is you know something's going to happen to one of these companies that they won't have a choice. They'll have to drop out. Yeah. Brian, I'd be curious as to your thoughts. I mean, we've got a lot of, I think, good things happening in the startup. Your discussions with people locally, for example, you're going to New York on this kind of startup deal, are there things that the community can be doing to help further support kind of the ecosystem of greater So at the tail end of my trip to Bonnaroo, uh, we stayed in Nashville and actually got to, I haven't told you this yet, we got to visit with um, the EC, the Entrepreneurial Center. Oh, you did? Yeah. That's yeah. one of the best in the nation. Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we have a long ways to go, don't we? <laughs> awesome. You know, this think this sprawling building, it was, uh, it was a parking garage for the city trolleys. The city owned it. And um, the, the powers that be that came in and said, can we have this? Is what we're going to do? Um, they put $5.5 million into restructuring the space. The components aren't that far off from the things that we have. Like our mindset is in the right direction. We just we don't have necessarily this exact facility yet, and the the, the 5.5 million that would go into it. Um, and then they got a 50-year lease from the city. So I mean, they're they're there to stay, and this thing is on its way. And I think that opened in 09 or 2000. Their first class came through in 2010. So I think um, I'm kind of answering your question backwards, but the more that that people like us and the Abbey Startup Accelerator and even One Million Cups. I mean, that the group there, you, you know, you guys travel to Kansas City and see other things. The, the more we can see what's going on in other places and bring those ideas here, it's not to say that good ideas can't percolate within the community, but to borrow from some of those places, because, um, you know, I'm, it's no secret, we're, we're behind, you, know, you look at Nashville, we are behind them. Yeah, we're, sure. we're five years behind. It's not saying we can't get there. Um, so I think to look at the successes and failures of other communities would be a key part of that. Um, I don't have anything off the top of my head that says we need this today, but um, yeah. yeah. Justin? Or <laughs> Is this still your dream job after dealing with you guys after four months? Good question. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, this is, yeah, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades, expert at none, and I, so I love this, this ebb and flow of now I kick into recruitment mode for the year and if next year we do two classes we'll have to figure that out because this is fairly intense and so um, <laughs> yeah I look forward to that challenge I, I love it so yeah not to dilute it but could you rubber stamp this for ag and banking finance yes yes tons of lessons learned we yeah it's I think any industry of, uh, that really sees themselves as a partner in the industry versus screw everybody, I'm in this for myself. I think any industry should look at it because in the computing industry I was in, which was hyper competitive, uh, we had a situation where we all worked together. And, and believe me, we hated each other. And I didn't want to be in the same room with my competitor. I hated those people. But we had a patent troll come after us and we got together and said, you know, we have to fix this as a group. And it was so successful. Once we got that hatred out of the room and said, you know what, it's, if you really care about your customers, you care about whether they get served, and you realize customers go from one place to another to get stuff, if you raise it all up, it's better. So yes, I think they all can do it. Now, you've got to really be careful of the laws. We have a lawyer sitting there every board meeting reading the legalities of being in the same room as competitors, and those lawyers stay in there the whole time, watching, listening, we take notes. We're serious about it, but yes, there's a huge opportunity. But they've got to want to work together. And you have to be smart and say, look, we're only going to work on the stuff that's not competitive. And if you think about insurance, there's so much compliance. There is so much reporting stuff where there's just so many reporting systems and uh, that are, you can't just, well, Mark can't say it's going to be this way from now on because there's a few other blues and others that say, no, 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 we're going to do it this way. Well, let's let it, somebody else in the third party make that decision. So yes, absolutely. I'll add one thing to that. I, I think what we're doing here is the future of accelerators. And we're not the too. first accelerator to, to focus in on a niche. I mean, Nike at it. Techstars Nike did. did it, and so we're not the first there, but I do think there's, it has its challenges, but the fact that you, the mentors, the mentors is the key to the program, right? It's not the 40 grand, it's not the symposium, it's the mentors, and the fact that you can hone in and get these mentors that are laser focused on what your startup is doing. Um, you know, I'm trying to think about one of our startups going to just a general Techstars. There's no way they, that Techstars, as great as they are, could have even compared to the, the mentor. Right density of mentors that we brought to the table. So I, I think um, it's rubber stampable and it's the future of accelerators. Yeah. What's the selection process for you know, potential participants? So we, we pull in applications from a few different places. There actually was some word of mouth and just locality involved. Uh, AngelList, uh, we are part of the Global Accelerator Network, which is a thing that's loosely tied to Techstars, or closely tied, how you ever want to look at it. Tied. Yeah. And, uh, they have created a portal where startups can come apply one place to all of the, the GAN members. So we pull applicants from all over. Obviously, we weed out on people that are looking to build specifically insurance-related products or services, uh, which takes, you know, 
about 10 to 1, if maybe even 20 to 1. 20 to 1. Uh, so it's, it brings us down to reality pretty quickly. Uh, that's why I was shocked to see 100 people applied for this Accord Innovation Challenge. So I, again, not being from the insurance world, it, it was kind of eye-opening to see that there are a lot of people working on this stuff. Um, but the selection process, once we've, we've got this pool of people we're looking at, um, this will be more intense about it next year. This last year, there's just no time. I did an hour Skype interview with each team. Uh, and they were all over the world. We did end up with a global representation here, but also I had interviews with people on, you know, 12 hours ahead and behind and all mm -hmm. over the place. So I would do the first vet and, and just to see, you know, is the whole team there? Can they communicate? I mean, do they have their ducks in a row? Just enough that says this is worth looking at closer. Then we took the paper application and I took that to the board members that maybe knew life insurance or PNC and said, is this legit? And they, and we had some that just said, and they're like, no, this no. is a stretch. Right? <laughs> they're building something really for another industry, and they're really trying to make it look like it's insurance focused, but it's not. Um, so there would be, on paper, there'd be some vetting. And then finally, um, again, I mentioned, you know, getting airtime with the board is pretty tough. Well, I, I had them all sit through a three-hour meeting, and we, we did 15-minute interviews with a handful of companies. I don't remember how many it was for that meeting. You can probably do the math. And, um, I, you know, that was, that's a tough process because... You get seven people in the room, and you get seven different opinions. And, um, and not to say it wasn't efficient, because I don't know what other way you do it, because you had to give everybody a chance to see everything. But um, that, that, I think, is the biggest challenge, because out of the seven, we got life, we got PNC, everybody, you know, they could represent different parts of the, the equation. And so we need to also have our candidates represent things they care about, if that makes sense. So it's, um, so there's a, there's a, it's not just insurance. There's, there's segments within insurance that uh, we need to make sure we're hitting. We probably have time for one more question, then we've got to wrap it up. Oh, wow. How'd I do that? One more question. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. that. Cool. Brian, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Go home. Yeah. Go home. Take care of your kids. Yeah.